Hello, everyone, and a happy Diwali to all friends and family in India and everyone who's celebrating today. Welcome to the second edition of Sound Sessions as part of Spark 2020. My name is Varun Desai. I'm an electronic musician and synthesis. I'm based in Kolkata, and I'm very proud to present Spark 2020, which is supported by the Swiss Arts Council Pro Helvetia. It is a creative platform that brings together artists from various genres and disciplines together for performances, workshops, events, and conversations in new and innovative uh, ways. The entire series is being technologically enabled by the Atakalari Culture Board, aided by the Goethe Institute, without whom this wouldn't have been possible. It's really exciting to be a part of these, this online community that's being built through Spark. And I'm very, very happy to be working with the Atakalari Center of Movement Arts to bring this journey of electronic music to a wider audience. Sound Session is a three-part journey through which we have artists play different genres of electronic music, after which we engage in conversation to unpack each artist's process in music, their influences, and we talk about the genres as well. During the first edition last week, I played an ambient and techno set. And today you're gonna to get a taste of the industrial side of techno music. Today's sound session features Aditya Nandwana of Animal Factory Amplification. And he's gonna be playing a pretty uh, intense industrial techno set for you all live on his hardware synthesizers, his Eurorack modular gear. So it's gonna be very exciting. We're gonna start off with that. We're also gonna be talking to Aditya about his music and work after his 30 minute set. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to have you participate in today's program. Uh, any questions about electronic music or our work, uh, please drop them in the comments below and we'll be happy to address them after the performance is done. And without further ado, over to Aditya for his set. Bye. 
Niyomi Boron. That was Aditya Nandwana of Animal Factory Amplification showing us how industrial techno is made live. That was quite a mind-blowing set. It went to so many different spaces. And uh, the second half is about to begin of sound sessions. That's when uh, I will discuss everything that's been going on musically with Aditya. So Aditya, thank you for that set. That was, that was really something. Hi. Uh... Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So, uh, to start with, there were so many different things that I heard in there. There was a little bit of uh, EBM in the beginning, some funky stuff. There was uh, the hard-hitting techno. There was this really gritty industrial sound. Uh, did you plan this to cover so many genres or did it just flow? Yeah, I, I actually did not at all. So in my head, before I started, uh, I don't really plan out my sets or anything. Um, like uh, everything I do is uh, improving the sequencing is completely from scratch. I don't uh, have anything saved or stored. Uh, what I do uh, just to maybe like uh, give the listener, um, uh, just, to, just to be nice on the listener, is just set up my rack beforehand. So okay. I'm not uh, I'm not creating my sounds as the video goes on because that would be very tedious. Yeah. Uh, but I do not know. I I haven't planned to go through that uh, space. Uh, that space. I, I guess I'm just like looking for. Um, I I do I play what comes naturally and and where the sound takes me. What I was actually planning to do in my head before I started was uh, something much harder and something much. Uh, much darker, I guess, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm just in a lighter mood today or something. <laughs> well, it, it was great. I'm glad we got to hear so much color in your in your music. And uh, before we actually get into the, the technicalities of what you did, uh, since you covered so much ground, maybe we can talk about uh, where this sound really originated from. Um, perhaps to start with, we can talk about industrial music because I know it plays a very big influence in uh, not only your music, but the pedals that you design. So could you talk a little bit about industrial music, its origins to you and uh, how it came into your life? Um, I think for me, industrial music started, like my pathway down to industrial music really started with uh, Nine Inch Nails. Okay. And uh, it was the, I think the album that changed everything was the Broken EP. Yeah. Uh, which is still today, I think it's a masterpiece and it's still one of the most angry, probably the angriest album I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, and that took me kind of down a rabbit hole because I said, okay, wow, I don't know who this guy is, but I want to know what he used to listen to. And um, I think it was a couple of magazine articles I read back then about, about industrial music. Um, and it, uh, I started discovering the the influences, I guess. And uh, you mentioned uh, electronic body music audio, uh, EDM. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I was already kind of like listening to a lot of heavy metal, but also, um, I mean, I grew up in the 90s and uh, we were definitely exposed to a lot of synth pop and uh, synth based music at that point. So, I, I, I it was interesting because then I, got, I found these bands like Knights of Ebb, uh, Frontline Assembly, from 242. And on the more avant-garde side, you had the, like, the core industrial bands like Throbbing Crystal, uh, who started it all um, by doing these very bizarre, I mean, almost performance art type um, sets, if you want to call them that. Um, the German grandfathers of industrial music, Einstürz and the Neubauten, who, um, who 
who are just like yeah, Angel today. Uh, is still one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, Coil, Prong, uh, Pop Elite itself, KMFDM. I mean, it just like it took me in the space that I really enjoyed because I really liked electronic songs, and um, I really liked aggressive music. So it was perfect. It was just kind of like outsider music for me. Uh, and I think I've always been a bit of an outsider in general to everything I do, <laughs> including music. Well, it's it's amazing that one spark led to you uh, searching for everything else in industrial music, because I know that. looking forward from that point of time you did a lot uh, because of this love for this music could you talk about how it influenced your further work after you discovered these bands and started listening to it uh, that's actually a really good question nobody's ever asked me that <laughs> okay. um so i think it was absolutely key to what i did because you had a lot of these i in um I grew up listening to music in a not very musical family, and um, I think I wasn't I wasn't like exposed to a lot of stuff um, back then. But um, I got I don't know. I think we had there was a group of us in school and like and maybe when we were in the sixth or seventh standard, and we said, okay, we want to let's make a club where we buy heavy metal tapes and then trade them with each other. And then I have a cousin coming down from the states or something. And what happened eventually was I started there. Um, I started fixating on sounds more than anything else. And if I listened to a sound that wasn't really the sound of a particular instrument, uh, so for example, if a guitar didn't sound like a guitar, if a guitar sounded like something very different, and um, just like uh, maybe like had it, if a guitar had a very synthesizer type sound, uh, that uh, that would fascinate it would fascinate me endlessly. I mean now. Uh, When I heard acid techno for the first time, or uh, uh, an acid bass line in uh, trance music or psychedelic trance music, I was uh, I said, "Okay, what's happening here?" And but by by then, I think by the time I was sixteen or seventeen, or uh, yeah, sixteen, which is when I heard Nine Shades for the first time, you have you build a vocabulary of sounds, right? Like you've heard. Yeah. electronic music you've heard synth pop you've heard uh, the depeche mode type stuff yeah. uh, you've heard um um you've heard like metallica and you know like you kind of are getting into guitar and back then in india everything was really expensive so if you want to buy distortion pedals or something yeah um you have to pay a lot of money but you might get there industrial told that on its head for me because these were sounds that were not part of my vocabulary i like they were kind of familiar but not really it was um i said this is uh this is something that's sonically interesting right it's not the music musicianship isn't an industrial music isn't great so i mean there's no virtuosity in the instrumentation most of the time yes but it's really about uh just how sonic textures are layered and i think that kind of drove me to uh, it pushed me forward in every way because i said okay you know i like music but i like sound more and i definitely have this thing for darker harder more aggressive sounds and uh a lot of that i think came from being exposed to um being exposed to these uh, these these textural sounds that you didn't get in a lot of other things and that's also the kind of sound i chase when i design my circuits for animal factory or when i design some like body to or uh even my like You know, if I want to make an echo effect, I don't want to. I mean, a lot of people say, "Oh, you need clean repeats, and you need uh, you need to be able to perfectly sync it." I'm like, I don't want any of that. I mean, you can get that anywhere else. Don't come to me for that. I mean, what I do is texture. So, I remember when I first met you, you were roaming around with a guitar, and I haven't seen you with a guitar <laughs> in many years. Could you talk a little bit about that time of your life when you actually used the guitar and um, elaborate a little bit about how it was to to try and create these sounds without access to equipment in the beginning? Um, yeah, for the sake of the world population and all things good and uh, holy, I I don't play the guitar anymore. Everybody's very happy about that. My family, my neighbors. Everybody is uh, cheerful, you know. Um, 
um, I was never a good musician. Like I said, I uh, I don't really have any formal training. I'm kind of tone deaf, so I, I can't even tell if my guitar is in tune or not. To be very honest, um, I did like I had this thing for uh, playing a lot of I don't know slide blues and everything. I think that specific time that he saw me playing a guitar. I was uh, just creating drones more or less that were in tune with the rest of the set. So I think I had a, I had a, some sort of minor, uh, a D minor scale programmed um, on my sequencer, on my synthesizers. And I was trying to get, um, I, I was playing with the room. I was playing with my guitar and I had this electronic drone stuff going on. And there was another acoustic guitar that was near the speaker. So what would happen is that uh, as the room grew louder, the guitar would pick it up and feed it back into an infinite delay thing, which would echo and echo and echo until it would be, um, I think, almost oppressive for some people in the room because then you just have like this D minor chord playing throughout the um, and nobody's really playing it. So it wasn't really playing the guitar, I was just like using the guitar to create sounds. Uh, for me, instruments are not, I, I don't, uh, I love the guitar, but instruments, any instrument is a means to an end. So um, it's just about what you use it for. Well, what, what you uh, describe sounds like the core uh, way of making drone music, or at least where it started. I've seen that, that, you know, just a long sustained note is played for an entire set and you're playing with uh, the textures of things. So um, did any of this process, creating these long drones, um, influence the way you make or you design your pedals? Which came first? Did the, uh, the noodling with the guitar come first or did you make pedals before that? I think it happened almost simultaneously because I made, the, I made my first pedal um, before I even owned my first guitar, actually. Uh, or I tried to make my first distortion circuit. So I'd actually borrowed a guitar from somebody and uh, I wanted to distort it immediately because uh, I said, okay, you know, if I just get an acoustic guitar and some sort of distortion effect, I'll sound like Metallica or Nirvana or something. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I think I was just kind of interested at that point. I didn't know anything about electronics, my you. So I had to get a lot of help. Um, like people helped me and uh, I got, I don't know, somebody showed me a textbook. This is a transistor, this is a resistor, this is a capacitor, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it took me years to actually understand the theory behind it. Um, I, mean, I, I, only did the, I did I did study as, uh, to become an engineer later. Um, the noodling with the guitar kind of branched off from that. So I think, uh, yeah, I did try to learn how to play songs at some point, believe it or not. I actually did uh, from like from popular stuff to dream theater, but obviously I didn't have the talent or the dedication or the discipline to actually see it through. Um, so again, I found, I found it really interesting to find ways of making the guitar a textural instrument. So I did uh, try to do the, um, uh, I got a cheap MIDI pickup at some point to try to use the guitar as a sequencer for MIDI, but it was it was just so bad that uh, I abandoned it. I, for the longest time, I owned a seven string guitar with something uh, by a company called Fernandez. And Fernandez, uh, they built guitars with a system called the sustainer system. And what that basically does is it drives the strings back at the same note. It's like pressing the sustain pedal on a piano, uh, only it's being done electromagnetically. So the, same, the, the string is physically vibrating and creating an infinite uh, note or an infinite drone. And then when you pass that through effects processing, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with it. So I've always been kind of interested in the idea of uh, using the guitar as something that can generate more organic textures. I'm not looking for clinically uh, neat and clean sounds because that's not what I do. Um, it, it happened hand in hand, really. I mean, it's uh, it started with, like I said, it started with the pedals, and that influenced the way I approached the guitar as well as an instrument. That guitar sounds really interesting. Sounds like a, a dinosaur version of the Ebo or something of that sort. 
I, I think it was happened after the Ebo, in fact. Oh, it was after the Ebo. Okay. I think so. Actually, the Ebo, Ebo, Ebo goes back quite a few decades, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, mistaken. so the Ebo patented the technology, which is why, um, I'm not sure. I, uh, so, Fernandez has a patent on the sustainer. Uh, there's another company called, uh, I can't remember the name, but they uh, they made something called the Sustainiac. Uh, they didn't build guitars, though. So, uh, they just had the Sustainiac technology. Fernandez had the sustainer. And... Ebo has their own patent. Um, and I think the key difference between the Fernandez system and the Ebo is that in the Fernandez, uh, they're still around, by the way, so you can actually still buy this guitar and uh, it's still produced currently. Um, what they, I think that the key difference is that the Ebo is played over the strings like a bow. Yes. But the Fernandez is built into the guitar. So it's actually a pickup that's built in, so you don't have to move anything. Right. It's all uh, you just turn it on to the switch. Um, I'm trying to think of prominent users. I think it was uh, uh, Reeves, Ga- uh, Reeves Gabriels uh, from uh, from uh, he was a long time guitar player for David Bowie. Uh, he used to use that a lot. Uh, Michael Brook, one of my favorite guitar players, actually introduced me to the idea of sustained guitar. So that's that's when I got into like. And then you run that through distortion pedals and you have delay and reverb and you play with all, you start modulating that and you create these, you can create these really beautiful soundscapes or really harsh ones, uh, whatever, you, I mean, whatever turns you want, I guess. Well, talking about the work that you've done, it's quite fascinating because you just mentioned your origins and not knowing technology, uh, but just for the people who are watching this, Animal Factory Amplification has become one of the cult guitar pedal manufacturers of the world right now. Um, just to drop a few names, Aditya was talking about uh, Nine Inch Nails. We had uh, Trent Reznor use your pedals, is that correct? At some point of time? He, he has a pedal. It was sent one. to him by, it was bought for him for me by Alan Mulder, okay. who uh, got it from Flood. Uh, so he has a pedal. I've sent him a pedal. I don't know if he's using it. Uh, okay. I I expect it somewhere, maybe used somewhere over there with uh, the millions of other things that he has. Um, well, one artist I know who has used your pedal because I've heard it on her albums is St. Vincent. Oh, yes. And yeah. There was this bootleg uh, interview of hers where someone asks, you get this question a lot when you're a star, what's your favorite pedal? And she mentioned yours. And I think that's, it's a great proud moment for uh, technology <laughs> from India. To have you know just one name drop uh, by a Grammy, multi Grammy award winning artist like that. Yep. So did that make a big difference to your visibility when that happened? You know, not as much as you think. Um, it did. I think it did like get a few people curious because uh, the funny thing is she never named the company. She said it's a it's a there's a there's a pedal company from India, oh, and right. I don't know if she yeah. didn't remember. Yeah. Or couldn't yeah. remember or wasn't allowed to remember um, right. yeah. um, because of uh, um, maybe endorsements, like yes, endorsements <laughs> from Ernie <laughs> Paul. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe uh, I don't know if she uh, what to see or what that was, but that's fine. Uh, this it made people curious, and um, what actually was way more interesting was uh, or what actually did a lot for me was. Um, Flood and Alan Mulder, who for me are like um, just through Nine Inch Nails, um, but they've also produced like almost every album that I loved in my teens. So I mean, you think of Depeche Mode, Violator, uh, Smashing Pumpkins, uh, Melancholy and Infinite Sadness, everything after Joshua Tree, um, uh, Nine Inch Nails, uh, uh, Jesus and Mary Chain. Uh, I mean, the list goes on, it's endless. Uh, falls, killers. Uh, so they actually have, and I, I, they were nice enough to let me have a visit to the studio, and they actually have a pit wiper distortion module, uh, distortion pedal at, for every desk. Uh, Mulder wow. explained to me that he just like, if he feels that a part doesn't have the right punch or isn't cutting through or something, uh, it's always in the aux input. His engineer has two of them. Uh, through a stereo, like a stereo, bu- so you can pass the entire stereo signal to the distortion uh, units, and um, 
they also have body toes. Um, so that actually uh, creates a lot more visibility for me because these are very established engineers. I'd say the, some of the best, like still one of the best alternative rock engineers duo in the world, uh, producer engineer duo in the world. Um, and eventually that gets to, into the hands of people like St. Vincent. So it actually really starts from there. It's like um, St. Vincent or a ride. Um, I think it was Fink as well, who amazingly started using the Pitfire for something I thought he would never do. But yeah, so actually it's, it's, it's people like that. And then it does help, but it's not like it's suddenly going to create 2,000 new sales for you or it's only going to land you that many more orders. It does, it definitely does help. Um, underground communities are it much bigger. Takes your, it takes your work into a very legitimate space. And considering that you are exploring technology and music that's quite in the fringes, uh, I think it's, it's also doing a lot for uh, the visibility of industrial music in India. Do you know if anyone in India has adopted your pedals to kind of push industrial music, any bands or other artists that you can think of? Well, specifically industrial, I'd say um, the two people I can think of really are uh, Nivid. So Nivid is the first industrial band from India. And what I like about them even more is that they're doing it in Hindi, uh, which... Uh, is becoming a bit of a rarity and uh, they're a great live act as well, like good production values and everything. So, um, uh, Nivit is definitely like they're using the God Eater or the guitar player is using God Eater um, for his song. Um, in the industrial slash techno space, Asymmetric, which is the alter ego of uh, Arjun Wagley, who's uh, arguably India's pretty biggest techno exponent. And I'm just loving the new asymmetric stuff because it's unbelievably brutal. It's a complete departure from what he does otherwise. It's just harsh and nasty and everything. Um, and very much the, 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 the area like, I know he uses one of my, uh, not pedals, but uh, so this guy, but in modular form in the back. So yeah. Um, if you're talking about just generally otherwise, uh, there's a couple of uh, drone bands uh, uh, who use um, my pedals as well. Um, I have to say, I got to thank you because you have everything that I've ever made, I think, in uh, the Eurorack format. So <laughs> there's that. Yeah. Yes, I'm very proud to be the owner of your some of the early editions of your modules and I love how they work. Thank um, you. Since uh, I don't know if we got any questions in the comments on the audience, but uh, I do have a question from my end. Um, just something to clarify the basis of uh, the pedals that you make. Could you talk and maybe show a few things in the rack? Co talk about the difference between um, the terms volume, gain, boost, fuzz, distortion, overdrive, and how they uh, feed into the work that you do, maybe with examples of which pedal does what. Okay, so do you do you want that to be a theoretical explanation, or do you want it to be like? If if we uh, can have a look at the pedals, then perhaps um, you could just show us the pedals because I don't know if we have much time for a demo at this okay. moment. Okay, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna take the camera off the off this thing if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah? Yeah. So just give me a second. Okay then, so I want to flip the video over. Okay. okay. Now what you're looking at is my setup over here. And um, this is, um, yeah, I've got a bunch of instruments happening here, just like mostly drums and um, a couple of other percussion things. Um, let's just take one sound that we can kind of focus on. And then I can show you what I'm doing. Yes. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm taking various sounds, putting them in the mixer. Okay. okay. And I'm sending a mix of those sounds through these channels 
into these two pedals. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The reason I use two is that one of them is a little more um a little more treble oriented and this one just has massive bass. Okay. So Are they chained I, chained serially or are you sending a parallel signal to them? They pa- they're in parallel. So what okay. I do is that I can have a little more control over uh things tonally. I can have the high end coming from this guy. Yes. And the massive massive low end coming from this guy. Okay. So it's um, like an EQ. Okay. In a way, yeah. In a way. So what I'm doing over here is let's see this as my regular sound. Um let's take a drum sound because that's the easiest to explain on. This uh to start with this is volume. Okay. Volume is um like what we uh, another way to say amplitude or what we would perceive as loudness so that's low volume high volume high volume etc now let's just take this back to um to this pedal and let's just start sending a little signal to it So we're looking at going through volume again. This is what I'm doing is I'm turning up the gain now. So what happens when you turn up gain is basically your amplifying internally you're making it louder within a system but you have to keep in mind that every system has a limit and when you uh, it's like when you make something louder or when you try to f- uh, imagine that you're trying to blow a balloon into an enclosed space and what's eventually going to happen is that the balloon is going to squish against the edges yes. and kind of flatten it out that's kind of the same thing that happens with sound um and now you can hear it getting a little more distorted so what happens when you try to exceed when you put in too much gain is that you give birth to something called distortion and what distortion basically means is that you're creating additional sounds that were not there in the original sound uh we're going to try it on this guy no so this is the new god eater pedal the 2020 version that's right this is the new god eater yes So what I'm doing again is I'm turning down the gain a little bit. So you can hear just a very it sounds pretty easy right now. And then as I go up you can hear it getting Now, the thing to keep in mind is that um the difference between the two th- the three things really is uh volume is basically the overall loudness gain is in a way of saying uh it's internal loudness um the when you're talking about it's very hard for me to demonstrate the difference between overdrive distortion and fuzz overdrive and fuzz are two different types of distortion okay um fuzz has a much harsher unrefined quality to it that's the best way i can put it and it so, uh, sounds like the word fuzz yeah basically it sounds like the word <laughs> fuzz and it's just like big and it's jagged and it's kind of a um uh overdrive is like for um if without getting technically into it uh in terms of like even an order order harmonics some of you know what they are 
but the best way I could describe it is uh, take somebody like Jimi Hendrix and take someone like Larry Colton and kind of just, 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 just compare their tones, I guess, compare the guitar sounds. Uh, an overdrive sound is a bit milder. It's, um, it has a little more warmth and in, in, in a sense, um, you're just nudging things a little ahead to some sense. Fuzz is, I don't know, I, um, I'm a fuzz guy. Uh, fuzz is a bigger, nastier sound. And gain is what will get you there. So I, I um, love, I love the, the balloon imagery. I think that was fantastic. Sorry? The balloon imagery was great. The way you explained Yeah, that's the best it. way I can yeah. vision. Like, if you want to think about, uh, if you want to think about these things in, in, in a non-technical way, uh, I think you have to just think about uh, uh, things that are expanding and getting deformed as they expand. Basically. I think if you can, if you can simplify your knowledge in such a in such a way, you really know what you're talking about. So. Oh, thanks. I, <laughs> I, I like that. We got our first question from the audience. This is a question from Adam McGregor, and it's about your pedals. Uh, can you he ask? Can you explain the difference between soft and hard clipping on AFA devices? Um, yes, not without getting technical though. So here goes. Um, soft and hard clipping are actually technical terms. I mean, as technical as the guitar as the guitar pedal world gets, I guess. But they're more like technical terms about where the clipping happens in the circuit. And um, hard clipping, in a sense, is always usually at the end of a circuit or the end of a gain stage. Uh, let's say you're amplifying something, and then you just kind of want to limit it down to a certain size. Right. So you take a signal, you make it 10 times larger. And then you say, okay, now let's uh, limit that by um, a factor of 10. So you're just, again, you're squeezing the balloon. Yeah. But you have to imagine that the balloon doesn't burst for whatever reason, but you're just squeezing the balloon and pushing it again uh, against a very small, um, into a very small room. That's kind of what, what hard clipping is. So hard clipping is, uh, in a way, it's limiting. So you're just, really compressing the signal and it has a different sonic quality to soft clipping. With soft clipping, um, this is usually almost always uh, in uh, circuits that use operational amplifiers. Okay. The soft clipping happens within the gain stage and the hard clipping ha happens after the gain stage. And sometimes the, dis the, the, the differences can be, uh, the differences are really subtle in a sense. But what usually happens in hard clipping is that um, it's very rare that you'll have like something that gets out of the limits that you've imposed. With soft clipping, it might just happen that you get a slightly louder signal or something that's a little more open. Um, uh, but with hard clipping, again, you th this is I, it's, it's technical talk. I wouldn't like really get bogged down by it because. It can sound completely different. It just, it really depends on, uh, it depends on a lot of factors, including what you use, like what kind of diodes. Uh, clipping is always done by diodes in these circuits. So it's uh, um, usually um, silicon, germanium, light emitting diodes like the Gorita uses or the Pit Viper even. Um, and it's, it's not easy to generalize. So I wouldn't get too Taken in, but if you want to, if you want to get into it, I'd say look up some circuits uh, which use uh, operational amplifiers. A great, a great example of soft clipping is that maybe everybody who plays a musical instrument uh, or specifically guitar knows is the tube screamer. The tube screamer, the Ibanez tube screamer, is the quintessential soft clipping circuit. Um, and it's almost, it's, it's kind of like a standard go-to uh, strategy for overdrive sounds. Okay, I think that that covers a lot. I could, <laughs> I could go further down the rabbit hole with this question, but uh, 
I'm not sure if everyone's interested. Uh, we are also, I think, out of time. And since today is a holiday, we don't want to extend it too long. Uh, you've played an amazing set today. That's something Thank you. that's, that's going to be very Thank memorable. And people are going to, I'm definitely going to go and listen to it several times again. And um, it's great to talk to you, Aditya, as always. And um, your, work, your work is inspiring. <laughs> it's amazing. And I think anyone who has come across it, who's used your pedals, especially us electronic musicians in India, we're really happy that you're doing your work. We're really proud that we can use your gear in our music as well. And uh, I'm also super happy to be working with you on things like the Poka synth where we're teaching people how, yeah, that's, to, build, that's great. That's great how to build their their own circuits and spreading this love for circuitry and uh, making geekiness fun. <laughs> Being an making engineer who turned fun. into a musician, I just want to share that uh, knowledge with people that, um, you know, these circuits are actually fun and it, it can be easy if you explain it in a simple way. And I think you do that really well when you impart your knowledge. So thank you for being with us today, sharing your work and knowledge. And I'm really looking forward to what you come up with. I know that brain of yours has got a million ideas. And as each one manifests, we're going to see new, you new and exciting things. But the other thing that you showed today is also the kind of music that you're exploring as an artist. Um, really happy to hear you do this. I encourage you to put yourself out there more into the artistic community and perform more after this lockdown is over because this is the kind of sound that um, is not really heard in the, the music circuit of India. And I think you could do with a lot more of this. Just find somebody to book me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always here to help. So with that, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. This has been episode two of Sound Sessions. We will be back next Saturday for the final episode uh, with another artist, Shantam Khanna from New Delhi, who does some really exciting work with synthesizers, generative music. He plays with a really cool band called Fopchu, where they mix up all sorts of uh, different sounds and explore new territories of music making. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you again, Aditya. Thank you. This was an absolute pleasure. Always great to talk to you, man. Thanks. And thank you all. Have a great day. Happy Diwali to everyone once again. Thank you, Atta Kalari, for doing this. We'll see you next week, Saturday at 7 p.m.